Welcome to the Lightning Podcast. This show is dedicated to inspiring God's people to read, study, and meditate on His Word. I'm your host, Adam Casolino. I hope you're doing all right. This episode, I want to talk about something I may have referred to in a few other podcasts. I sometimes say that a lot. Uh, in my last podcast or a previous podcast, that's because God's Word, you know, it's interconnected. So one thing is not isolated from another. So we often will talk about things all at once or connect different things. And also in Isaiah, it says God's truth is built line upon line, precept upon precept. So we build a foundation and then grow from there, but we're always still standing on the same foundation. And whenever I say that, and if you haven't listened to a a previous podcast, there's plenty. You can check out uh, any of them that seems to spark interest. They're not connected as far as a series that you have to start at the beginning outside of a few that are numbered. So take a look. But today I wanted to get more in depth with this particular uh, topic. This particular area, I believe, is doctrine. And it's something that I feel, I'm going to refute something. I'm going to talk about something that some pastors and teachers may be really adamant about. Uh, You may have heard about this before. You may have never even thought about this. Or what I say may actually conflict with something you hold very deeply to. But that's okay. The whole purpose of us researching and studying the Word of God is so that we can grow in our understanding of His truth, even if that means sometimes confronting things that we were raised to believe even in church, that might be unbiblical or untrue or just somewhat inaccurate. And as I get into it, you might even think, well, I don't even see how this is relevant to a study of the Word of God. How is this important? But once we get into it, I hope that you'll begin to realize this is actually pretty useful and helpful and important, especially when it comes to understanding certain spiritual dynamics in your own life, how you confront sin, how you grow spiritually. And I feel that what it, how it's often taught brings a lot of confusion and it's, and it's unbiblical and it doesn't really help us understand what God is doing in our lives. When we look at it biblically, uh, things come into focus much more. There's a lot more clarity and understanding this particular aspect of who we are and and of our lives. And that's what God wants. The enemy would love nothing more than for us to be confused and unclear about who we are in Christ and unclear about how we grow and how we overcome sin uh, so that we're not growing or or we're constantly hitting setbacks and we don't understand the biblical path of spiritual maturity and we're just in darkness uh, to a certain extent. So what I might say, it might be different than what you've heard before. I'm not going to share my own opinion. My opinion doesn't matter. We all have different opinions and views, and that's fine. Uh, But we're going to look at what the Bible says and try to gather a better understanding of this truth from Scripture. And like all these episodes, this is a jumping off point. If this is something that seems interesting to you or it stirs up a, a curiosity, then I encourage you to go deeper into these passages that I mentioned. There's going to be quite a few scriptures I'm going to mention today. So if this is at all something important to you, I hope that you will go and do a deeper study when you have time. So what I want to talk about today is who you are in Christ, who you are as a human being, literally what you're made up of. This might not seem as important as deeper studies, but I think it has a very important impact on how we see ourselves in Christ. Now, some people teach... um, pastors or other leaders, that the human being is made up of three parts. And they'll say body, soul, and spirit. That is who you are. They'll even frequently use the term, your spirit that has a soul that lives in a body. And some will even try to make comparisons between the Trinity, God's three in one, so we're three in one. The problem is that is not a biblical view of human beings. It's so, become so common. I don't know where it started. I don't know where this idea began to trend, but one person taught it and then it just got caught on. And like so many other uh, forms of uh, telephone doctrine, it's just gotten repeated and repeated with no biblical foundation, no doctrinal foundation, no foundation in the scriptures. But yet we repeat it and it makes no sense. Because how does that even work? How does it even look? Now, what they will say, and some people are very adamant about this, like all forms of pet doctrine, and I define pet doctrine as not biblical truth, but things we've decided are true based upon our own bias or our own prejudices or what we've raised to believe, but has no real foundation in scripture. But these pet doctrines will defend with our very lives to the point where we'll even break up churches or denominations that will have disharmony amongst Christians over things that are not only unbiblical, but actually pretty stupid to fight over. And this one particular doctrine, okay, this is a very good example of what I've been repeating again and again in past podcasts, 
They base an entire doctrine that defines who we are as human beings, even Christians, on one verse of the Bible. And they take it completely out of context, without any kind of corroboration, and we're supposed to believe it as if it's truth. And the one verse they point to is in 1 Thessalonians 5. This is a good example of both reading Scripture in its proper context and then weighing Scripture with the rest of the Bible. As I said, two or more witnesses. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says this, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved, blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, some people will point to that and say, See? It mentions spirit, soul, body. That means that must be three distinct parts of our humanity, and that is what we are. There's a lot of problems with that. First of all, let's read this passage in its proper context. This is the end of 1 Thessalonians, the letter Paul wrote to the church, with lots and lots of encouragement and teaching and doctrine, which is why we study it in Scripture. But this is the very end. This is literally uh, the last few verses of the final chapter. And if you have a Bible that breaks up the passages and, and gives little headings, It'll say, like, final blessings or final prayer and, and greetings. And this is literally the end of the letter. It's not a time where Paul is teaching anything. He's instead giving encouragement. And it's a blessing. The rest of the, the book ends, verse 24, He who called you is faithful, who will also do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read to all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So this is not a part where Paul is teaching. He's just giving encouragement, and he's pronouncing a blessing over uh, the Thessalonian church. And I've mentioned in previous podcasts that in the, the Bible times when they were writing, they didn't have things like underlining or capitalizing or highlighting. The only way to emphasize something that's really important is through repetition. If you have a good Bible that is a literal word-for-word translation, you'll often find in passages where Jesus is speaking, you'll often have him saying things like, Verily, verily. If you have a King James Bible, you'll notice that he'll, before he starts saying something, he'll say, Verily, verily. More modern translations might say, Truly, truly, because that's what the word means. And you have a translation that wants to fix things for you so it sounds a little better, it might say, Most assuredly, or something like that. The problem with that, of course, is that they're adjusting the scripture, and it kind of erodes some of the, the accuracy and some of the richness that's in the original translation, which is why I strongly prefer a word-for-word -word translation. But why did Jesus say it twice? Was he stuttering? Was, what was going on? Well, as I said in previous podcasts, I talked about parallelism. That's a dynamic in scripture where the Bible repeats certain things in order to emphasize them. And with parallelism, it's, it's line by line, like we saw in the Psalms and in the Proverbs. But repetition is often used by God to communicate something. And in that case, he literally says the same word twice because he's really trying to get your attention. In John chapter 3, he says, Verily, verily, I say to you, unless a man is born again, he will not enter the kingdom of God. So why did he say that? Well, that's a pretty important piece of doctrine that Jesus was communicating to Nicodemus. And you could say, well, why didn't he emphasize it the way we emphasize things? Like shouting it! Well, he was talking with Nicodemus at night in a relatively secluded place, and Jesus is not going to wave his hands and be all dramatic and demonstrative at a time when it's inappropriate. So he repeats this introductory word in order to get his attention, to emphasize what he's going to say. And then he repeats that theme again and again. He says you must be born of water and of spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. He says, and then he says to Nicodemus straight out, you must be born again. So that idea is very important. So he says, truly, truly, in order to emphasize it repetition. And getting back to 1 Thessalonians 5, that's what Paul is doing. This is not doctrine. When, right as Paul's about to say goodbye to the church and he's blessing them and he's encouraging them, he's, gonna, he's not going to stop and say, oh, by the way, here's some doctrine about the human humanity, physical body, soul, and spirit, and this is what we're made up of. Especially since nowhere else in scripture teaches that. He's instead repeating himself. He is speaking a blessing. Uh, he's expressing his confidence and his hope that the church will be kept blameless until the coming of Jesus for his church at the resurrection. And he's saying, may the God of peace keep you sanctified and holy. May your whole spirit, soul, body be preserved blameless. It's like saying, may every inch of you just be kept blessed by God. The, the top of your head down to the soles of your feet, even your toes and fingers, everything's blessed. That's what Paul's doing. He's emphasizing and repeating himself in order to communicate just how confident and joyful he is that these people will be preserved and kept blameless by the Lord up until the day that he returns. 
And the reason why he repeats spirit and soul is because that's the part of us that it is going to remain. Our bodies, yes, we kept blameless and we want them to be healthy and blessed, but one day they'll pass away. But it's that inner person that will be kept blameless forever. So he repeats it. This is not doctrine. This is not something that you take out of context on its own and build an entire teaching on. We don't do that. That is bad biblical interpretation and teaching, what we call exegesis. What this is, is us reading into this, the text what we want. That's not biblical. That is not a godly way of studying scripture. Instead, if you were to read the scripture and you were genuinely curious, okay, what is the human being made up of? Are we a spirit and a soul and a body? Are we a heart and a mind and a will? Are we fingers and toes and knees? Like, what are we made up of? And you base it solely on this verse, you're going to get some really wrong conclusions. You need to go back to the rest of Scripture and see what the Bible says. In reality, if you do that, you will learn that the human being is not triune, made up of three parts, which is inaccurate compared to the Trinity, because that's still like saying Father, Son, Holy Spirit are somehow parts of God, rather than each one is God, but in perfect unity with the other members of the Trinity, God, one, three, and one. But saying a human is body, soul, and spirit, that means God is body, soul, and spirit. It makes no sense, and that's inaccurate, and that almost tries to elevate humanity to the place of God, and that's not true. The Bible teaches that in Genesis, God made man in his own image. He said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And that was speaking of our physical bodies, our physical forms. In the New Covenant, the Bible says our inner man is made to be like Christ. In Ephesians 4, it says, and to put on the new man, which was in the likeness of God, has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. So the Bible teaches us they're not made up of three parts. It's very simple. We're made of two parts. We're a body and we're a spirit. Just like in the world, there's the natural world, the physical world, and then there's the spiritual world. Jesus himself says, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. There's no mention of a, some third th emotional thing. When people talk about the soul as being somehow separate, they say it's our mind or emotions and it's something different. The Bible never teaches that. God is spirit and we worship him in spirit and in the truth, the truth of the word of God. Jesus also goes on when he's talking about the struggle with sin. He says the spirit is willing to obey God, to do the things of God, to do what God commands it. But the flesh, our earthly physical nature, is weak. The Bible teaches that there's two parts of us, a body and a spirit. And we get this, and I'm not making this out, this comes from scripture itself. In Romans chapter 7, Paul talks about the struggle we have in trying to obey God's word. He says, the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do, that I do. But why does he say that? What is the thing that is making him end up falling in sin? He explains this in Romans chapter 8, that it's the flesh that causes us to sin. And he goes deeper in Romans 8 to describe the dynamic. Now, before we get into it, we're going to read Romans 8. Romans is the foundational book of understanding your faith and the doctrines of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's the foremost book of theology ever written next to Genesis. And any study of theology that neglects Romans is a very bad study. So if you want to grow deeper in your understanding of your faith and of sin and of righteousness, you study Romans. So if Paul was going to go into this dynamic of the human nature, in any other book it would have been in Romans. So if the human being is made up of body, soul, and spirit, and the soul is somehow separate from the spirit, and it's a part of us that causes us to sin, he would have mentioned it here. Instead, what does he say? Let's look at Romans 8. Verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For the law could not do that it was weak through the flesh. God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Verse 9 says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now if anyone does not have the spirit of God of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells within you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. 
and then we'll go on a little bit more, but you see the struggle here very plainly in black and white. It's not a struggle between body, soul, and spirit. It's a struggle between body and spirit. Paul makes it very clear that the part of us that struggles with sin is our physical nature. He even says our, our flesh has its own mind, the carnal mind. But our spirit is the part of us that wants to please God. So let's pause for a moment and look at this dynamic. Okay, Ephesians uh, chapter 1 and 2 goes into this in great detail. It's very valuable when understanding this concept. Again, we're looking at numerous passages of Scripture, two or more witnesses to confirm this truth. We're not going to pluck one verse out of context and teach it. We're going to look at what the entire Bible, or at least many key patches, passages of the Bible, say. And Ephesians explains that before we came to Christ as sinners, we were spiritually dead. Ephesians 2 once says, You were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the year, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others. So, before we came to Christ... We were spiritually dead. Our physical bodies were alive, but our inner person, the Bible says, was dead. So how does that look? We're talking about our inner man, our inner spirit. It was spiritually dead. It had no life within it. The thing that it had existed for, which was to commune with God and to obey God, it was incapable of doing because it was corrupted by sin. It wasn't dead the way we think of a tree being dead or a body being dead, just lifeless lying there. It existed, it, it, it had activity, it could think, it could process things, it's you after all, but it was corrupted, it was in darkness, it was evil. That's why the Bible says the heart is evil beyond anything else. Who can know it? That part of you uh, was lost, it was in darkness. In fact, if you want to use a, a picture, remember from the old uh, Christmas carol when Jacob Marley visits Scrooge and he's like, his ghost visits him, he's covered in all these chains and in bondage, that is a good a figurative picture of what our spirits look like, that we were completely corrupted through and through, charred, black, and dead in sin, because the spirit is the part of us that is meant to commune with God. And in many ways, it's almost like we didn't even have a spirit because it was so deadened to the life of God. It's like nerve endings that are dead. They no longer feel anything. They no longer have any ability to do what they were made to do. When we were in sin before Christ, our spirits were that dead to God. But what does Paul go on to say in verse 4 of Ephesians 2? But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So, when we received Christ as our Lord and Savior by faith, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within us. If Paul goes into detail in chapter 1 of Ephesians, he explains this dynamic. He says in verse 13, In him, Christ, you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So we see very clearly in scripture, our spirits were dead. But when we came to Christ, we were made alive. The Holy Spirit came and dwelled within our hearts. Our spirits were now alive. That's what we call being born again. And it is such a fundamental change. Hear me out. It's such a dramatic transformation that took place when you received Christ that the Bible actually describes it as getting a brand new spirit. Ezekiel 36, where God is promising uh, the Israelites, this coming covenant, he says in 36 verse 26, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you'll keep my judgments and do them. And that's not like hyperbole or figurative language. That very much is the change that takes place when we come to Christ. Paul uses this term of circumcision. When we come to Christ, there's this removal of the old person. That's the old spirit being removed, and we're giving a new spirit. In Colossians, he says this, In him you are also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by the putting off of the body of sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. In Romans, he says it this way, He who is a Jew, being meaning a, a child of God, a chosen one of God, is one who is an inwardly, the circumcision that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not for men, but from God. So when you come to Christ, that old dead spirit that we're talking about that was corrupted in sin was literally cut away. 
and almost surgically removed from you, and you were given a brand new spirit. In Ephesians, once again, it says in chapter 4, we have put on a new man that has been created according to God in righteousness and holiness of truth. I quoted this earlier. So our new spirit is made in the image of God in Christ Jesus. That person on the inside of you is brand new, alive, born again, holy, blameless, righteous. It's because he's made in the image of Christ. The very righteousness of Christ is yours. That is the real you. And that is where the Holy Spirit dwells. As it says in Ephesians, we receive the Holy Spirit as a down payment. When we say we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, that's referring to the Old Testament when they literally built a physical building where the presence of God dwelt. But that was just a symbolic picture of what we have in Christ. Colossians says all those Old Testament th details were simply symbols, shadows of the substance, the reality that we have in Christ. So God wasn't interested in living in a physical building or a tent made of, you know, ropes and cloths. He was interested in living in the hearts of his children. And that is what we have in the new covenant through Christ. Because he took our sins on the cross, we could be completely forgiven by God in Jesus. So that takes place in our inner person. Okay, and when we're born again, we are 100% a child of God. When a child is born, a baby, he's not half a human being, right? He's not 35% a human, and each year he becomes more and more human. No, he is 100% a human being. He's just a tiny little one who is very young and knows nothing and has to learn. The only difference between a 21-year-old man or a 50-year-old man and a newborn baby is just time. It's just age. And that older man, hopefully, is wiser and more mature and more capable and is intelligent and can do things that a baby can't. Same thing with your spiritual life. You're not partially saved or temporarily saved or just 30% holy or saved. You are 100% born again child of God. You're just spiritually young and your spirit grows. That's what we call sanctification. Just like a tree that starts with a seed, it starts out as a little shoot, a tender shoot that pops up out of the grass. It's 100% a tree at that moment. It's just not a full-grown mature tree that's bearing fruit. It needs to grow, just like a baby growing up into an adult. Spiritually speaking, that is you when you come to Christ. There's no partial sanctification. People say, oh, your soul is being saved. It's in the process of being saved. No, you're either saved or you're not saved. You are either 100% child of God or you're not. So there's no part of you that is somehow in between being godly and ungodly. Your inner man is 100% godly, but it's growing and maturing. So where does the struggle come from? Obviously, you still sin. I'm not saying you're perfect. By no means. Far from it. The Bible says we are in a process of growing. And it says in Ephesians 4, in another place, we grow until we become perfect or mature or complete in the full image of Christ. That's not going to happen until the day Christ returns. And we're all resurrected and raptured and see him face to face. So until that time comes, well, and you're still on the earth, you are maturing and growing. But it's not like you have this separate soul thing that is kind of stuck between sin and godliness. No, that's not what the Bible says. Romans 8 says the spirit wants what God wants, but the flesh wants sin. The Bible never says your flesh is wicked. In fact, the wicked part of you was your heart that was replaced when you came to Christ. So your flesh, it's not evil, it's weak. It's fallen. Jesus said the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. So when you're tempted for sin to sin, your weak flesh lacks the power to resist sin and temptation. That's why if before you came to Christ, if you're raised in church or in, in, as Paul describes in Judaism, you may have wanted to please God because you heard about the Bible, you heard about the Ten Commandments or right and wrong, and you wanted to do good. But you, because you weren't born again, you didn't have the Spirit of God dwelling within you, you were incapable in and of yourself to do right you would eventually, inevitably, fall into temptation. Even secular psychologists talk about how willpower and that strength, that determination to stick to a diet or an exercise or a life change eventually runs out. It's like your physical strength. You eventually get tired and you need to go to sleep and eat and replenish your strength because it's limited, because your flesh ultimately is weak. And even your willpower, even your determination to do good eventually will run out. Even if you're the most morally upright human being in the world, in the flesh, you would eventually run out and stumble and trip up and sin because your flesh is weak. We cannot live in the flesh. Some pastors teach that living in the flesh means living in sin. That's not accurate. Living in the flesh, as it says in Romans 8, is trying to please God and obey his law in your own self. 
in your strength, in your natural strength, determination, willpower, intelligence, might, and we all fall short. We eventually run out and we stumble into sin. But Paul says in Romans 8, if we dwell in the spirit, if we abide in the spirit, we can have the power to overcome temptation and sin and be pleasing to God. So our daily call to God in our relationship with him is to resist the temptation that our flesh so eagerly wants to do and to be led by the spirit. Romans 8, to pick up what we left off in verse 12, it says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many are as led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not the receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. So we see here Paul once again is reaffirming the concepts taught in Ephesians, that our spirits received the Holy Spirit at salvation and we were made sons of God. And by the Spirit of God, our spirits can tell our flesh, you're not in charge. That's what he means to put to death the deeds of the body. We're not putting to death literally our physical body. We're putting to death the deeds of the body, which is living according to what our physical bodies crave and desire and trying to do good things for God in our own physical strength. We always fail if we try to do that. But if by the Spirit we tell our flesh, you're not in control. You flesh are in submission to my Spirit, and my Spirit is in submission to the Holy Spirit of God, who is in fact God, who's teaching me by His Word. Because our spirits are the part of us that is in union with Christ. Our spirits, our inner man, are participants with the Spirit of God to be used by God, to serve God, to know God, to be guided by His Spirit. Your spirit is where your faith dwells. It's where you're, you bear fruit. It's where you bear the gifts of the Spirit. It's where you're filled with the Spirit. It's where God speaks to you and ministers to you. Your outward body, the Bible says, decays. It can learn, it can grow, but it is needs to be under submission of the Spirit. And notice, there's no mention of a third part, the soul. The struggle you face every day is learning how to get your physical nature, which includes your physical mind, that brain of yours, that gray matter, that's a part of your flesh. Again, it's not evil. It's simply weak because you're still living in a fallen body. One day you'll get a new body, as it says in 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians and in other places, even here, we will be resurrected, receive a brand new body that is perfect, and it won't have even the inkling to sin because it's been renewed. That day is coming, but right now, God wants us to dwell in the flesh, to be used by him, to serve him, and that we may grow. And that is earning us a reward in the kingdom, so it's a very good thing that you're here right now, growing in Christ. So your physical mind, that gray matter, that is a physical part of your nature. You could ask any doctor or neurologist, thoughts and emotions and desires are chemicals in your brain. Now, they may not understand and acknowledge the spiritual side of yourself. They think you're just a physical being, or at least some doctors or scientists do. So they'll say your whole life is just your physical nature. We know that's not true, because the Bible says right here in Romans 8, we're flesh and spirit. But there are thoughts in our minds and desires and intentions and will that come from our carnal mind, our physical mind, and they're not always pleasing to God. In fact, in in a very real way, most of the time, our flesh wars against God. In fact, Peter explains it this way in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11, he says, Now, beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against your soul. That's consistent with Romans 8. Our flesh doesn't want to do what God wants. And in fact, when our flesh craves sin, it wars against our inner man. So the struggle we have now as Christians is to put to death those desires our physical bodies want and to learn each day by growing in the Lord how to walk by the Spirit, to allow the Spirit of God who dwells within our spirits, who is empowering our spirits and energizing our spirits to live for God, to be in control, not as puppets, but as servants, as children of God who is learning from Him. And that's where we get our another major passage that teaches about this dynamic in Galatians chapter 5. Okay, I mentioned many verses here, but Romans 8 and Galatians 5 are the two key passages that teach this dynamic. And Paul describes, starting at verse 16, he says, I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, 
so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and of, and the like, of which I told tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So we see here Paul once again is teaching the church that we're of two natures flesh and spirit. And in fact, sometimes it feels like we're of two minds, which the Bible also says. He says here that you do not do the things that you wish, because if you let your flesh uh, be in control, you'll always want to do the thing that is easiest. Oh, I don't want to get up early to pray, or I don't want to study the Bible, or I don't want to go to church, or I just want to sit here and watch Netflix, or it's easier just to lie to get out of this thing, or to think these sinful thoughts, or to indulge in these things. Your flesh is always going to tear you down. It's always warring against your soul, your spirit, who desires to serve God. So Paul's saying here, what's the key? How do we do this? How do we overcome this? Walking by the Spirit. He says if we live in the Spirit, meaning if our life comes from the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Christ, then let us also walk in the Spirit. Walk signifies a day-to-day lifestyle in the Spirit of God. I've mentioned in the past, to walk by the Spirit, a really good definition, a starting point, is to be taught how to live by the Spirit of God according to the Word. You can't walk by the Spirit unless you're in the Word of God. The Holy Spirit is the one who will teach you and give you insight and understanding in God's Word, and He will give you the power and the ability and the desire to live it out. What's so amazing is when we walk by the Spirit, we're not reading the Bible and then in our own flesh and natural mind trying to do what it says and then constantly failing as if there were rules put on our shoulders. No, no, no. Walking by the Spirit... In this new dynamic, being born again, is we read the Word of God in order to be fed spiritually, in order for us to know God more, and then God, by His Holy Spirit, changes us from the inside out. Our spirits grow, just like a baby, a healthy baby, is being fed and grows. Our spirits grow and gain more power from the Holy Spirit, and that begins to saturate our natural mind, our natural body, and we begin to walk almost automatically, almost naturally, spiritually, according to the things of God. So at times we're doing what God wants us to do without even consciously thinking about it because our inner man has been transformed and is growing and is thriving and is the one in charge rather than our outward man, the flesh. And that's a process that goes on even when we're not thinking about it. It goes on throughout the course of our life. But the more we abide in the Word of God, the more we prioritize the Word of God, the more we seek to know Him more and to grow in Him, the more this process takes place. Because you could starve your spirit just like you starve your physical body. And then you could choose to let your flesh take over. And then you're a Christian that isn't fruitful for God, or you're struggling, or you don't understand, why do, why do I have all this struggle? And then you have people coming along saying, well, you've got a spirit and a soul and a body and these things, blah, 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 and you have no idea how to overcome the sin in your life because you think there's this soul part of you that is in the way. And how does that change? There's nothing in Scripture that talks about the soul being separate from the spirit needing to be changed. It's your body and your spirit. Paul talks about it in Romans 12. He says, be renewed in your mind. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind in other passages. See, your spirit has a mind that is full of God and full of God's word. And by the Holy Spirit, your natural mind can be transformed. It's still weak. It'll still fall. But your physical thoughts can begin to become in line with the spiritual thoughts of the word of God. And you'll find yourself overcoming your sin and temptation. There's no third thing. Your will and your emotions are either of the spirit and of the flesh. And you might be wondering, well, this thought, is this of the flesh or is this of the spirit? How do I know? What's the difference? I don't understand. The more you study God's word, the more you learn discernment, which is deciding between truth and error, truth and lies, the more you recognize that this thought and this desire, this is coming from my flesh, this is clearly not of God, and you learn to submit it to the word of God, the spirit of God. But when you have thoughts and desires that are in agreement with the Word of God, then you know they're from God. The Holy Spirit Himself is going to empower you to fulfill those thoughts. If you have a thought, you know, I should pray for my friend. I haven't heard from him in a while. I'm concerned with him. I'm going to pray for him and then give him a call and see how he's doing. 
You don't have to wonder, was that from God or is that my flesh? No, that's in agreement with the Word of God. The Word of God says, care for one another. Look after one another. If you have a thought where you're suddenly jealous of a friend because something good happened to him and you wish, oh, I wish that happened to me. Why does he always get the good things? I don't know. That's clearly of the flesh. And that's not of God because you don't have to be jealous of someone else because God's taking care of you. Just as much as he blesses them, he'll bless you. And your life is different than his and you could take joy in the good things that happened to him and he could take joy in the good things that happened to you. You see, it all comes down to knowing what the Word of God says so that you could recognize what is of the flesh and what is of the Spirit, the Spirit of God. Now, there may be some of you that still disagrees. I mean, I showed you a scripture. You see the dynamic very clearly played out, but you say, the Bible still says soul and spirit and heart, and I disagree with you. Okay, you're free to disagree with me. I'm not God. I'm not the authority here. I'm simply looking at scripture. But here's a little bit of insight that can help you uh, understand this idea that both in the Old and the New Testament, we sometimes get caught up in our English language. That's why I often say we need to look at things from a Hebraic, biblical perspective and understand the Bible wasn't written in English. It was written in Hebrew and Greek, and the words that are used are being translated into English for your benefit. But sometimes it's good to look at the original languages to give us a better insight. Now, in the verse of 1 Thessalonians 5, where it says body, soul, and spirit, that some people have construed into this entire doctrine, in the Greek... It's two different words, translated soul and spirit, but what's really interesting are the literal translations. Spirit, in the New Testament, is often from the word pneuma, and guess what that means? Wind, breath, spirit. So it's this general word that can refer to many things, and in many languages, when we talk about spirit, the word is often connected with breath, wind, because going all the way back to the beginning, when God breathed into Adam's nostrils, he received life, and that's where we get the concept of spirit. But what about the word soul? Well, soul in the Greek is the word psyche, where we get our word psyche. And guess what that means? It comes from the word suko, which means breath and spirit. So these words have shared meanings. And in the Hebrew, it's not that much different. In the Hebrew, um, the word spirit, you may have heard it before, is ruach. And the Holy Spirit is the ruach hakodesh. And it means, again, wind, breath, life. So it has the same similar of meaning to the word pneuma in the Greek, meaning breath, wind, spirit. But what about the word soul translated into English from the Old Testament? Well, that word, that word is often napesh. I'm not pronouncing it perfectly, but it's napesh, and that means a soul, a living being, a life, self, person. So it's a little different than the Greek word, but it doesn't, it's not talking about some inner part of you. In fact, if you look at the context, most of the time when the word soul is used in the Old Testament, it's referring to a person's life, their entire life. It's not a specific piece of you. It's actually a very all-inclusive word that talks about you as a living being, a person, your actual nature, both your physical and spiritual nature. So it's you can't say it's a, it's a separate thing, your mind, will, and emotions, as some people say. No, it's the word soul in the Hebrew it actually can refer to your spiritual life, your physical life. It refers to your entire being. So in the Greek, spirit and soul are essentially referring to the same thing. In the Hebrew, spirit is spirit and soul is your entire person. So there's no biblical foundation both in the text and in the language that says that we're three different things. We are a body and a spirit. And in Christ, that spirit is made alive by the Holy Spirit. We're born again And although our physical bodies may struggle with sin, by the Spirit of God, through His Word, we could overcome the flesh and be obedient to God, looking forward to the day that these physical bodies will be transformed in brand new heavenly bodies and will be perfect and dwell with the Lord in that peace, in that joy forever and ever. Now, as I recap this, you may not not agree with what I've just said. That's okay. I'm not brokenhearted about it. But look at Scripture. Study the passage I mentioned, particularly Romans 8 and Galatians 5, and ask yourself, really, does the Bible teach this idea, or has it just become popular amongst Christians and then we just repeat it mindlessly without really seeing it? Because God wants you to understand who you are, and he wants you to understand these dynamics so that you may live in a godly life, overcoming sin and bringing glory to him. So hopefully... By the grace of God, by his wisdom, you'll continue to study these things, and God will give you a better understanding. Thank you for listening to the Lightning Podcast. Lightningpodcast.org is the main website where you can find all articles and episodes.